Hello, Guardians. Welcome to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I am your host, Corey Deering, and alongside me, as always, the Jotun Toten, Vault Dwelling, the Epilogue, Josh Finney. I feel like that, the Epilogue. Yes. We're like getting dangerously close to calling me the Alpha and the Omega, and I don't know if that's like sacrilegious or not. I mean, you always be the Alpha to me, Josh. You'll always be my Omega, Corey. Cool. I don't know if that's bad or whatever i don't know either but i don't I'm understand go with that. i don't understand these weird fake greek letters from a long time ago every time it's in i the see bible, it's okay it's in the bible it's okay whatever bible's not real uh <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> hope my mom doesn't listen to this podcast because she'd hit me with one uh, <laughs> hope my grandma doesn't listen to this <laughs> uh, like josh what's a sandwich casual <laughs> It's okay, uh, grandma. It's okay, grandma. Just, just drink, drink your, drink your V8 juice. Oh man, it's good times. Good times, everybody. Sandwich Dude, what, casual. What a, what a freaking week. What a freaking week. I know. It's but, been... Corey and I both had our respective homes flood. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're watching the video version, I apologize for the mess behind me because this is literally the only space where it's not like a consistent living space. Is the office so? Uh, there's a TV that hasn't been turned on in a year and a half. There's a crib. There's some furniture, bags of stuff. It's, it's, uh, hmm. Yeah. Man, I just, uh, yeah. I don't even want to think about what is next. Uh, how's your flood, Josh? Good? I mean, my, mine was fine. Mine was definitely like less hard to clean up than yours because thankfully mine was just in the entryway. But um, I'm, I'm going to inspect the damage on the bookcase behind me tomorrow. Mm. Uh, I've, I've been afraid to look underneath where all the water went mm -hmm. uh, to see just how destroyed it is. Because, I mean, you know these things. These these things are cheap. They're particle board. Um, I got to know if I need to go out and spend 30 bucks on a new one. My mm -hmm. apartment complex has not emailed me back despite me. I went in and talked to the manager, and I sent her an email with all the pictures, and she has, like, yet to respond to me which is probably not a good thing mm. um at the end of the day yeah that sounds uh questionable at best as they say so yeah dude it's uh there's still like two huge fans in our basement that are blowing <laughs> water around like <laughs> rotor rooter was here oh like the God. the foundation like restructuring people were here our landlord was here it was uh it was a good time and i was at work for it and my wife had to deal with it on top of two you know children under the age of you know four so it was uh right it's i don't know i feel bad i f i feel bad but i also feel more bad for her because she was here by herself Oh. It, it yeah it, it has not been it's not been a good week for either of us in regards to um home ownership yeah they well, got they got apartment everything apartment renters for rentership i guess for both of us yeah uh look all i'm saying is the amount of money it's going to cost to fix what happened i'm glad that we don't have to pay for it uh it's fair it's fair so <laughs> Uh, plus like anything that was kind of, you know, destroyed or whatever is covered under the landlords, uh, the, like, it's like a landlord insurance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then anything that it doesn't cover, then we can claim it. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time. Good time this weekend or, or this week. Like a, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I laughed a little bit. You were talking to our friend Colonel Panic mm -hmm. and you said that, uh, your, your Halo 3 Legendary Edition survived, but um, the Reach box did not. It looked much like Reach itself at the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah. I I, uh, I will admit, I, I had a, like an ugly like snort laugh when I saw that. <laughs> I was just like... <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> definitely, definitely said that. It was... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the exact tweet here. It was... Uh, uh, I already retweeted so many things, I don't even know. Anyways, it was pretty funny. I, I chuckled at myself, too. I was like, ha, <laughs> I made that joke. Oh, I said, uh, I said, so tonight's agenda, trying to salvage what the flood didn't destroy. And Colonel said, uh, 
Oh, he sent me this. He sent me an animated GIF of a flood attacking one of the uh, the priests or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, "Don't worry, Colonel Panic. My Halo Three helmet survived, but the Halo Reach box, well, ended up like Reach, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Also, real sad when you look at it, but also funny." So, anyways, Josh, uh, we're here to talk about some Destiny. The end is here. The new season is upon us. It's approaching. When you listen to this, we are roughly 11 days away from the reveal. Yeah. We, we've got one more show to get through before the, the, the big hammer drops. The big one, as they say. So, I, I, guess, I guess let's start there. So, you know, in the interest of, you know, setting expectations, um, we'll come next week with some actual predictions. But right now we know for certain Witch Queen uh, Season 15 and the Trials revamp are coming. I also su- strongly suspect they have to address crossplay and Game Pass uh, PC. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well as the future of the Game Pass deal, right? Like, I feel like those are pretty... Like those, those are probably like your pillars of what happens there, and then anything that happens after that is anecdotal. But with that coming up, I mean, it's it's funny. Like I feel like in the air with like some of the Bungie employees we see on social media, with like members of the media, with you know just people who are who play the game, like you and I, like there there it feels like there's something in the air mm-hmm. with what's happening this month. Like, we're all kind of, like, sitting here with bated breath. And I know a lot of people, like, are really excited for that Trials revamp. I know most of us are tuning in, though, because we want to see what the story beats are going to look like. Are we actually going to Old Chicago? Are we going back to the Dreadnought? Are they going to bring Crota back as a dungeon? Like, these are questions and theories we've had for so long now. And, you know, like, all summer, it's it's been ramping up and ramping up. And now that we know that's happening, it's happening the week of Gamescom directly before Microsoft's presentation at Gamescom, so you can like almost guarantee they're going to show another trailer or the same trailer right after, just like they did last year. And I last year and with Shadow Keep, like I guess it's interesting. Like I, I think like we talked about Halo last week and how the the hype cycles are almost going in tandem with these two games. Like <clears throat> we know we're going to find out when Halo is coming, you know, and there there's the persistent rumors about the crossover content and like, you know, oh, well, you know, like what they just announced, like confirm some of that leak, like, oh, what they just said doesn't. And, you know, we, we talked about the Crucible, you know, the, cru- the Crucible tweets last week. And I don't know. I just feel like everybody is like kind of sitting here. Like, I don't remember the last time I saw so many people who work on this game like this excited. Like, I don't think we had that around Beyond Light. I think, you know, COVID really sucked a lot of that out of us last year. Yeah. It was still so raw and so recent. We got that reveal. And then the gut punch of we got a delay to November. We can't even have a normal hype cycle for this game. Like, plus now I, it's like. Plus, oh, I wonder ahead. I wonder how much stuff, like, they were excited for. But, like, they switched engines. COVID happened. There's so much going on behind the scenes of the game mm-hmm. that, like, I mean, I think we've even talked about it a little bit to where, like, Beyond Light was a good expansion, and it definitely set the groundwork and a foundation for what's coming. But it definitely mm-hmm. wasn't like their biggest expansion, you know. Uh, the seasonal stuff that they did afterwards was really good, right? In the storytelling and uh, everything. But like, I feel like the Beyond Light campaign itself, and maybe some of the side things weren't as as powerful as something like Forsaken was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. Uh, maybe the and and now like, I think everybody's excited for Savathun because I think everybody is expecting a Taken King style like massive moment, right? Uh, and I think and and as we get excited, I think maybe that gets the devs excited to show it off a little bit, maybe you know. Right. So I don't know. I just I feel like. Since Destiny or since Bungie left Activision, uh, the pub like under the publishing or whatever, they they've really they're really hitting their stride with with these last two seasons, and now we're getting ready for the final season of this and into a major expansion that they're like super excited for. I don't know. I think it's 
I'm I'm excited to see the twenty what's happening on the twenty fourth for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think you know we talk about you know we talk about future of the franchise, and I mean there's there's always an outside chance that you get something like multimedia announced. Um, you know, I, I think like in terms of setting expectations, like that's probably not something that's happening this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for me, it's I'm excited to see not only the new story beats we take, but what comes next in terms of bringing back uh, Destiny One or Destiny Two content. Because it kind of depends. Like, if we go back to the Dreadnought, it's like, well, you've got three strikes right there that were... I mean, I don't know if I if widely loved is the terminology to use, but mm-hmm. were definitely... They were definitely a thing. Like, I think we all have horrifying memories of Shield Brothers and of the oh, Dark God. Blade. God, dude. Shield Brothers, especially... Hey, can you imagine like, those on night. Grandmaster? God. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I don't please don't bring back shield. Brothers. I guarantee you too that I will be skipping if they're on Grandmaster. Dude, it sucked uh, on a regular Nightfall. Oh yeah, it, it was, and I mean that that's the thing. It's like right, you you have those. I mean, clearly there's a base for Venus in the game with Vault. Um, you know, do you unvault some of the Venus strikes? Do you you know do we bring back some of the Moon ones? I mean, do we do folk? Literally, the entire uh, strike is already in the game. As a patrol area and as a nightmare, do we bring back Fogoth? Do we do the Tannic Strike? Do we, uh, you know, do we do Shadow Thief? Do we do? I mean, they've uh, already shown with with Omnigal, like with, like with, you can just switch out the end boss, right? Like they've already shown us right. that you would do. And that, I, I so. mean, I think they, I think they want to like kind of like walk that line very carefully because mm-hmm. like. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, like of the ones to switch out, I don't think Omnigal was the one to do. Um, I think that's just very, that's very strange that that's the one that they chose to switch out. Like, considering how much she's referenced in the game, right? Like in Shadowkeep and in, um, I mean, Vanilla D two, we had her mentioned a few times, and definitely in D one. Like, if you're going to keep unvaulting Destiny one content, like you should probably just left that as it is. I think, mm-hmm. but they changed it up just so we could have Shah Han get a moment of revenge where he doesn't actually get revenge. Because he doesn't do anything. Gosh, he's the worst. Dude, he's the fucking worst. I swear. I saw somebody say the other day, Hawthorne is literally the worst NPC that Bungie has ever made. And I'm like, nope. Shaw Han, step on up, buddy. You wow. you have won the prize. You are the weakest link. You have been voted out of the Big Brother house. You must leave the mansion. Like, <laughs> just anything you could think. You've been voted off of the island. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Like, there are, there are so many things... You can say here about Shahan, and uh, we could fill a book and not get to all the bad things. But you know what did fill basically a book up, Corey? What filled up a book, Josh? This, this fucking Schwab. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was another it's, beefy it's, one. It's a beefy boy. We we've got another beefy boy coming next week. They thought next week is when we're going to get into specific uh, weapons and uh, exotics. You know, weapon archetypes, exotics. I think we're all a little nervous for what it means for grenade launchers, uh-huh. but uh, you know you live and die by the meta. We have a we have an awful lot to get to this week, though. We have some specific exotics to get to. We have war mine cells to talk about. We have iron banner changes coming, iron banner weapons. Um, but we're going to start here at the top with champion mods. I am extremely excited about these uh so you have anti-barrier auto rifle you have unstoppable fusion rifle unstoppable sidearm unstoppable i believe that's a scout rifle i think it's scout rifle and overload bow they've also hinted that there will be an overload sword mod um it is not explicitly in this graphic but it has been uh referenced by the community managers on twitter um, kind of as a as like a wink wink nudge nudge, and I don't know if that's we're gonna get a mod or if that's gonna be an exotic sword that has that built in. Um, but there there's been a lot of discussion this week about this particular graphic. Uh, they revealed it yesterday morning, I believe, they were on the 11th of August, on Wednesday morning, and the fact that the only anti barrier mod is. Uh, auto rifles and we have three unstoppable mods and presumably two overloads uh people are going well you know what do you do for what do you use for a ranged option for anti-barrier this season 
Because let's be honest, a auto rifle is not always going to do it. You have to empty so much just to get one of those shields down. Then actually doing the damage is another thing entirely. Um, I don't have a huge problem. I think the only problem where the, the only content where this is going to be a really big issue is going to be in uh, master raids, uh, in master vog, and in um, grandmasters. That's where you're going to run into the biggest issues with this. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot, I've seen a lot of people point out. Oh, Ariana's vow counts. How many of us actually enjoy using Ariana's vow though? Like, if you don't like hand cannons, literally your two choice, your literally your only choice is to run an auto rifle. Right. Um, this probably indicates that the season is going to be a lot more uh, taken based. Great. Than other seasons. Yeah. Well, I mean, come on. We all knew that this was coming, um, but I do hope that Bungie takes some of this criticism to heart, or there's. I don't know, an exotic pulse or something that has anti-barrier uh, auto-loaded into it. Because, man, it's pretty clear they're focusing on over or not overload, but unstoppables and, to an extent, overloads over anti-barriers this season, which probably a good design choice. You know, change it up a little bit. I know that's going to make some of these encounters a lot more frustrating to have unstoppables just bum-rushing you um, and overloads and things like that. Um I think I'm most excited for Unstoppable Jotun. <laughs> Jotun is finally viable in PvE again. And I let me tell you guys, between that and Telesto, <clears throat> we're going to be yeeting ourselves, I think, more than the enemies. Great. I can't wait to run a strike with, with you and, and Nerd or you and Colonel, and it's just like, y- you yeet us off with the Jotun. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely going to be a thing. Um, I think we're going to have to see how these play out. I know a lot of people liked Overload Bow when it was in la- or uh, when I don't know if it was Overload. I think it was Overload Bow was in a few seasons ago. Um, everybody really seemed to enjoy it. In fact, uh, it was during Chosen, I believe. People seem to really enjoy that auto rifle, scout rifle, pulse. Like those seem to be you know pretty normal ones. I do not like this trend of making sidearms. A thing with the champion mods? Can can we not? Can we not do this? This is this is continuing to be a problem. <laughs> um, not a fan. That is, that is not something I want to be running. Uh, also, because I don't really have a sidearm that I really like am in love with in this game right now. Last Hope was kind of the only other one, and you know, I'm just you know, Bungie. If you wanna if you wanna unvault that gun, you know you know where to find me. Hmm. Um, this feels like they're trying to force us to use uh, Cryostasia. Yeah. Like, they're just like, no, you will use this and you will like it. You will like it. <laughs> uh, but the, the first big change that we have here is something that's been requested for, God, since the game came to PC, since it came to Steam, probably. Uh-huh. Um, I think that's when I, I started seeing this request around Forsaken, and it's only continued. It's only gotten worse. They thought they had a solution last year, you know, giving it to us for, you know, no cost on our legs. Well, it's still needed. And that is traction. Um, so we're, we're going to we'll talk about this. Uh, traction mod feels mandatory for PvP on controller and unnecessary on mouse and keyboard. It's felt to be more appropriate as an accessibility option rather than a balanced choice. Players, including us, have also long felt maximum 10 sensitivity was not enough on controller. So we're making some changes to bring controller input closer to parity with uh, keyboard mouse. Um the sprint turn or turn sprint turn speed scaler. God, that is a mouthful. Jeez. Um, it has been that's been added as an option, and as a result, they've removed uh, the traction mod. So, you know, if you play a lot of PvP, you're gonna just probably. I don't know that I've ever taken the traction mod off of my legs, um, unless I needed another scavenger or something for a raid. Uh, or for a raid or for a grandmaster. Other than that, it pretty much stays on all the time because I, I do prefer the way that it moves. It's why I ran Stompies for so long uh, when it was built in. Um, added additional controller sensitivity options. 1 through 10 will remain the same. 11 through 20 will increase over that. Um, that's really good news for a lot of us. I actually play on low sensitivity, so I'm probably going to experiment with this and jack my sensitivity up a little bit. Um and then ADS ADS sensitivity modifier as well. Um, very interested to see how that works out. But this is good news. The traction mod is being taken out of the game completely. 
um, and it's it's needed. The uh, exotics that we're covering today, um, part of them are uh, super super regenerating exotics, and these are just kind of bullet pointed before we get to the big ones. These are the ones I think of all the changes I'm most excited for for the exotics. Um, I'll use these quite often if you're a warlock you're probably always running geomags uh if you use um or god uh arc blast i don't remember what the actual name but i'm completely blanking out on what the actual name is right now uh, and i've called it the moira beam for so long that i keep trying to call it that and that's not what it is <laughs> but um on these the uh, first set of changes coming in Season 15 have to do with exotics fun super energy. As a group, these ex- tend to sh- outshine other exotic choices, especially in high difficulty end game activities. In some cases, they trivialize the content or make it the only reasonable option to equip for your build. Our changes here aim to standardize how these exotics work and place a cap on how much super uptime they grant by themselves. Um, some perks were reworked to be more generous with their refund minimums. There's also a new member of the family. So, Shards of Galnor is the first one here. Um... I run this all the time. Like, it's embarrassing how often I run this because I really, really, really like using Blade Barrage. Mm -hmm. It's not a great super in PvE. In fact, it's, like, damn near useless. But I still really like using it. I definitely leave it on in PvP and in Gambit a lot of the time um, since I'm typically running Divinity and high-end content. Shards of Galnor, though. Increase the amount of super granted for hits, but total super regen is now capped at 50%. Um... That's good. You used to be able to get an entire super back. Uh, and there are some still some activities that are still glitched with Galnor. Really, the one main thing remaining is Mayhem. Um, and I don't know if these are still going to be bugged in Mayhem. If they are, then, well, my Mayhem days are probably coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I, I mean, I, th- I think that's good. It definitely makes it viable and a little bit more content. If you can land all your blades onto a big enemy, you can like definitely get your or, you know, throw it into a whole group of enemies. You can get like half your super back right away. Combine that with people dropping orbs and hey, you've got another super ready to go right there. Right. Um, I know it's definitely busted in the Atheon encounter. You can just sit there and chuck shards over and over again at Atheon, which is pretty funny to do. Um, seeing the look on my raid group's face when uh, I'm not on Nighthawk and I'm running Galnor instead has been funny. But uh, it's usually in between me popping the Divinity Bubble up for them. Uh, we have a couple of Titan exotics here. We have three Warlock ones. And the Titans, Ursa Furiosas, cap the amount of super energy you can regain once your super ends at 50%. And in fact, that's the only Titan one. We have four Warlock ones. I was mistaken. Skull of Dire Ahamkara. Uh, increase the amount of super refunded to kill, but total, total super regain capped at fifty percent. Capped at fifty percent seems to be the uh, the big one here for all of these. Phoenix Protocol. Cap the amount of super energy you can regain once your super ends at fifty percent. Um, Phoenix Protocol was one where if you were running it in endgame content, you could run that and pretty much constantly have your super up. I still think if you're running this in like a raid, you're probably going to be getting it back pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's Phoenix protocols, kind of the, front, where I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I know so few people who actually use Phoenix protocol. Uh, most of us, if we're, if we're running wells, we're probably running Luna factions. Um, so I'm curious to see how this affects, uh, the one or two guys that, uh, are in my group Phoenix protocol a lot. Nerd generalist is one of them. We'll have him sound off on the 24th about how he feels about it. Um, Storm Dancer's Brace now refunds up to 50% of your super energy after your super ends based on the number of kills. Um, I don't know if that was a regenerating one before, but it is now. I guess it's an attempt to make uh, Stormcaller a bit more uh, usable. And then Geomags. This is the big one. Removed Sprint the top off your super. So no more sprinting around in trials and getting your super by like the end of round three. Right. And having those constantly up. Um, this uptime in PvP then was healthy and gave a two minute of control warlocks an immediately renewable supply of super energy for paying for mod costs like special finisher in PvE. Um, very glad that this guy nerfed um, 
it's something that I even people who use Geomags a lot or and who use you know Arc Blast and things like that have gone, yeah, this is this is a little bit too much. Um especially in PvP modes. Like I think it was great in things like PvE. I almost wish they would have figured out a way to let you keep that for PvE and taken it away in PvP, but mm -hmm. I understand the decision here. Uh, you gotta get a couple more orbs, though, like the rest of us. And then there's a lot of uh, retunes and reworks. Um, yeah, there's a not, lot of reworks there, here. There really is a lot. There's not a lot for... There's almost nothing for Titans. Um, there is a lot for Warlocks and Hunters Hey, whoa, here. whoa. Precious stars, Okay. When's the last? Do you even have precious scars? No, I don't. I don't even. <laughs> um, I Ice fall so, so. mantle. Okay. <laughs> Come on! It removed the slower class ability recharge scaler. Oh man, <laughs> Corey, I'm sorry. Gosh, <laughs> Titans got a lot of love. Uh, the last I'm hurt couple by of this. updates. I'm really Titans hurt by this, Josh. You don't Listen, get it. You don't I'm understand. I'm upset that Bungie is still pretending that Orpheus rigs do not exist and that Hunter Supers outside of Bottom Tree Golden Gun are not a thing. Okay? <laughs> we are openly pretending that nothing matters for Hunters right now. <laughs> I'm still waiting for a Titan armor set that doesn't look like, I don't know. Rain gutters? Yeah. Oh, my God. It looks like we bought you at the Home Depot at this point. God, Home Depot. I'd say, like the habitat for humanity the leftover scraps jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> starting with some of these accessories cory already cory already told you what the titans are getting uh precious scars uh burst of healing and bonus recovery around whenever you kill an enemy with a weapon whose damage type matches your subclass type i think that's actually uh i think that's really good um especially if that's work if that works on your teammates i think that's a really good change to that exotic yeah um but the question is, like, do you give up the exotic you're already using then? Uh, I think that's one that you're going to see a lot in PvP, not necessarily PvE. Um, I think PvE, I mean, most people are probably still going to be running um, Falling Star. Mm -hmm. So, which makes sense. And then Ice Fall Mantle uh, removes slower class ability, recharge scaler. Um, the Hunters. I want to talk about the Hunters for a second. Hunters finally got some love. We finally had something good happen to us. Finally. They didn't They didn't nerf something into the ground for us this week, so that's a win right away. Bombardiers. I, I like these. Uh, when you dodge, it drops a bomb that damages the enemy. The bombs will now have a secondary effect based on subclass type. Blind for arc, burn for solar, slow for stasis, suppress for void. Uh, suppression will not affect guardian and super. I think that automatically makes Bombardiers a top tier exotic for PvP. Yeah. Just straight off the bat. Yeah. Uh, I already like using these in there. Um, like I said, I'm usually running Galanor. Um, but in things like Iron Banner, I like running these. Um, I just have never really had that great of a role on them. Uh, but you better believe that if I can get these to drop at like a 65 or higher, I'll masterwork them and use them all the time. Mm -hmm. I really, really like because I liked them, but it's a little bit hard to trap the enemies in the bomb occasionally. Yeah. You basically have to do it as like a dying move. But if you can do this and, you know, blind or, you know, burn them, you can you can probably get the kill off if you can, if you have burn. Um, but this would make me want to experiment with other classes. Because I use Stasis and Solar almost exclusively in Crucible now. So I, I think those are really cool. Um, Graviton Forfeit, of course, that increases uh, invisibility. Uh, bonus, invi blah, 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 blah. bonus invisibility duration is increased. Melee regeneration speed now increases based on number of enemies near you. When you're invisible, recovery is greatly increased. Weapons reload quickly. Uh, that's cool for people who like use Spectral, spectral Blades. That's a really good exotic. And then Lucky Pants. Our friend, our friend A1 Johnny is very excited about these. Added intrinsic hand cannon holster mod replaces previous functionality with the following. When you, re when you ready a fully loaded hand cannon, deals kinetic damage or damage matching your subclass energy type. For a short time, each hit against a combatant from that hand cannon increases the damage of the next shot. No, Hawkmoon won't be able to one-shot a raid boss using these legs. Other hand cannons will get a fun edge in combat, though. What's a hand cannon holster mod? A new kind of mod that reloads stole weapons. More on that below. Um, the, again, makes Lucky Pants instantly viable again. Um, an exotic that really has 
almost always been overlooked. That looks really cool. If you like hand cannons and you play a hunter, which, I mean, if you're playing high-end trials, I expect to see this a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, this and bombardiers, I expect to see a lot in uh, trials and in comp next season. I, I think that those are great changes to two exotics that we people want to use, but we just can't. Um, bombardiers, I think, were at least usable, but this I think, takes them from being usable to being... Like, a very good, like, at least a B-grade exotic. I don't know if they're quite up there with Gemini, but I think they're getting there in terms of exotic hunter boots. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adding secondary functionality to some of these, though, especially on on movement exotics, I think is absolutely essential. Um, I I would like... I don't know what that just was. Wow, what was that? That is a dog in the hallway. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> that usually it's, me usually so it's much. my background noise that requires me to mute jesus christ well i sit right by my front door so yeah. it's funny because um, in your camera picture it like i can see the fronts of your of someone's shoes sitting at your door and it's like it looks like somebody's just standing there watching you podcast <laughs> it, it's it's not great it's not great uh Warlock's got Warlock's got some uh, some updated uh, updates in their exotics as well. Uh, Verity's brow change the trigger when you get a weapon kill to match your subclass energy type and increase grenade damage bonus to twenty percent per stack up from ten. Per- Stag will now grant damage reduction to allied guardians standing in your rifts twenty five percent against combatants fifteen percent against players. That's awesome. Uh, I think that makes Stag useful again too. Mm-hmm. But again, if you're and this is this is the interesting one. Like, I guess if you stack that with somebody already using a well, and you drop a rift in there, that would help. Um, I can see this helping in Master Vog. I can see it helping in uh, the, specifically the Templar encounter, or in I mean, God, for any of the encounters, really helping on the plates, etc. Uh, I think that helps a lot. Twenty five percent is twenty five percent is twenty five percent. I don't know. Interested to see how that one plays out. Uh, I don't really know anybody who uses Stag outside of Chelsea, and she hasn't played in like two years, so she only uses because it looks cool. In her exact words. So I don't know if you're one of the five five people in the world who uses Stag. Let us know what you think about this change. I mean, look, it's all about fashion over function and destiny. We all know that. God, dude, <laughs> I, I I wish that Celestial Nighthawk looked better then. Um, <laughs> The Prometheum Spur, uh, increased functionality. When standing in a rift, solar weapon kills give you class ability energy. When your class ability energy is full, solar weapon kills will consume that energy and spawn a combination. Healing and powering rift at the target's location. Absolutely love this. Big fan of this. Um, and then they says, uh, the final thing here for the exotics. Keep your eyes open for other changes to come awake of these as well. Our goal for the next few seasons, especially following the launch of Witch Queen, is to increase the variety of fun and powerful choices available in PvE and PvP alike. So this is a first pass on exotics. There is always there's always a chance that Orpheus rigs will get touched again somehow by Bungie, or that Star Eater scales will be put back to being a usable exotic, even though we just got them and got them nerfed into the ground right away. Yeah. Hmm. About that. Uh, <laughs> I, I like what they're doing with a lot of these though, where they're adding they're at they're adding on to exotics rather than just making new ones. Yeah. And I think that's important. I would like to see more exotic weapons going forward and like choice I choices are important. Like I expect us to start seeing that do stuff with stasis or with, you know, if there's another darkness tower, like, oh, increases darkness abilities. Right. You know, just across the board. I think that those are probably coming this fall. Mm -hmm. I suspect they had a couple that they wanted to put in, like, in the summer, and they were like, well, we just nerfed everything into the ground, so um, we probably shouldn't put these in the game yet. Yeah, about that. Probably see if they're going to destroy anything else that we're working on first. Yeah. So, uh, really, I, I guess before we move on from the exotics, like, do you have you have any takeaways? Do you have anything else to add there? Uh, I think a lot of it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, I I think Destiny is always an evolving game, and I think if you're gonna mm-hmm. keep older stuff in the game, and like, because they took it, obviously they took out sunsetting, and exotics aren't sunset at all, right? I think making sure that. If people, if if you're going to keep those in the game, they need to at least stay somewhat relevant, and I think that these changes are good. Uh, 
most of them across the board. So uh, I I don't really have anything else to say. I mean, they pretty much said the Titans are perfect. So, you know, Titans are yeah. perfect. That's all I have to say. Titans are perfect. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that. But uh, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> uh, there's uh, some updates to how some mods are going to work. And there's uh, there's a new mod that we get, new mod we get to talk about. New mod. So, yeah, um, and th- these are all for ammo economy. Very excited for this, um, but I specifically say here, running double ammo scavenger mods made it too easy to have 100% uptime with special weapons in PvP and PvE. In PvP specifically, we believe this is an important factor in how oppressive certain special weapons feel. Reducing their effectiveness is a step towards addressing that. We're prepared to revisit this depending on how it plays when it's out in the wild. We're also looking to improve ammo finder to make it a bit easier to earn special and heavy in PvE. Thank God! Right. I cannot tell you how many times I've done an entire strike with no divinity or no heavy dropping. I cannot tell you how many times end game content and you have to have like special finishers on at a certain point or heavy finishers to get stuff at the risk of not having your super when you need it. Right. Because there, it just simply will not drop otherwise. And then you play other ones where it's like, dude, I you just keep dropping it. Like I never, why can't you do this when I have nothing? Right. So, uh, Ammo Finder will now have an increased chance to spawn ammo on kills with primary weapons and a further increased chance with exotic primaries. Love it. Big thank, fan of it. Thank you. Love it right there. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Multiple copies of scavenger mods of the same type no longer stack. Uh, I don't know if I like that. I just ran. <laughs> then again, I look at the current mods that I have equipped on my armor, and it's like all grenade and sniper mods all the way down. Uh, from when I've been do- I've been doing uh, inverted spire grandmasters for the last couple of weeks, uh, trying to get I got that adept plug one. Uh, I did not bring my role with me to talk about tonight, but I will bring it up uh, next week. I'm very excited about it. Maybe I'll have a special sniper to talk about too. Ooh. Uh, yeah, I need to earn it next week first. I've yet to earn any of them, so I'm, instead of earning the regular one, I'm just gonna go for the adept one. <laughs> Might as well, you know. This is the mod I'm most excited for here, though, and Ooh. it's holster. Um, a lot of us have auto loading holster on like our our slug shotties, on some of our, our vorpal snipers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's gotten to the point where we're almost ignoring other perks with auto loading holster. Right. I like this as a mod though, because it's a new type of leg armor mod that will gradually reload stowed weapons of the matching type over time. Multiple copies of holster mods of the same type will increase the raid ammo as reloaded. So I really like that. If you really want to double down, like, and make sure you're like, you don't have auto loading on your sniper, but you have uh, like snapshot warble or something. Mm-hmm. You want that to be constantly reloaded, high end PVE. You can stack those mods. Good. The following weapon types will have holster mods: auto rifle, fusion rifle. You all Yotin all the time, baby. Yotin all the time. Power grenade launchers. That's a very good one. I like that. I like that they differentiate here too. Hand cannons, linear fusion rifles, machine guns. I'm excited about the machine gun one too. Pulse rifle, scout rifle, shotgun, sidearm, submachine gun, sniper rifle, and trace rifle. Also low key very excited about trace rifle. Can't tell you how many times I've needed like. I'm very excited. My I'm super. Very excited for trace rifles. I we need a new good trace rifle. Right. We uh, we need a stasis one. Yeah. The last trace rifle. Well, so I was going to say the last one we got was Divinity. The last one we got was actually Ruinous Effigy. I forget that that gun exists. Yeah, but it was cool when it came out. And, it was and, a then, year nobody, ago. and then nobody. We need, legend, we need legendary trace rifles is what we need. Trace rifles are only exotics. Right. I want legendary trace rifles. Uh, Saladin, put it on the menu for an iron banana next year, please. Yes. Um. Uh, it is worth noting here, there are two big uh, points. Hand cannon excludes Ariana's Vow. Oh. Uh, so you're still going to have to load that normally. I mean, hand cannons aren't that bad to reload, though, I feel. Um, and then rocket launchers, breech-loaded grenade launchers, and bows will not have holster mods, as we did not want to affect any weapon that has a magazine size of one. Um, so ambitious assassin, auto-loading holster continue to be really good perks for a rocket launcher. Although I think at this point, most of us would rather have um, lasting impression and impulse amplifier. Yeah. Um, that seems to be the go-to for rockets these days. Breach loader, grenade launchers, ambitious assassin, man. All the way. Get that salvager salvo out there. That's what you want to be using. 
Um, uh, the, Great, great changes here. I like those. I run ammo finders and scavengers a lot, obviously, uh, in high-end content. Mm-hmm. And holster, I mean, I, I plan on using this uh, whenever I need to run something. Like, I need to run Anarchy. I'm probably going to have one of these on. You know, I'll have this with an ammo finder. Right. Uh, because now that it's going to increase with primary kills, or and especially with exotic primaries, I feel like that puts less pressure on me to put special finisher on. Or to put heavy finisher on, you know, you just do them to the corresponding ones. And it, hey, it gives me more mods to go earn because um, I've got like three thousand mod components. Jesus, Christ. that I haven't, been, I can't use any of them. I get to use like ten a season. So I'm gonna need some way to turn in these uh, these mods. Uh, the final big change that we have here is more mine cells. Uh, we knew that this was coming. We all knew it was coming. They've let them run rampant forever. Um, again, high-end content is where you see a lot of Warmind cells. I have a few friends who have managed to master them. Of course, friends of the show, A1 Johnny and Nerd Generalist, uh, are usually the guys I see running Warmind. Matt tends to run them, too. Yeah, Mitch, I have never... Mitch was telling me that he's been building a Warmind build. I'm like, well, that's... <laughs> Probably I'm glad you right. spent the time on it because it's about to get nerfed. That's what I told him. I was like, oh, well, you picked a great time to start building a warm mind build. Um, I mean, they, they've run rampant for about 18 months. The duration of the pandemic is basically how long they've been in the game. And uh, these are mods that a lot of people, I feel, didn't really start understanding until Beyond Light. Yeah. Um, and when they started putting them into the Artifact mod. And so I, I want to read what they specifically say here this paragraph to be blunt these are too powerful this is not a surprise even at their introduction we knew they were very strong that was the whole point at the time these were created they were only expected to last for about a year so we could push the envelope on something cool and flavorful knowing they wouldn't be around breaking things forever with the force of rasputin they would have time to shine but eventually leave and make room for the next exciting thing now that they're able to remain viable and ending in-game content indefinitely we think it's necessary to bring them down to be more in line with what the rest of the sandbox is capable of. If we didn't, it would cause ongoing problems for activity design and weapon rewards. I like that they say this because that, to me, is the clearest indication we are getting something new, a new kind of mod in this next season that required Warmind Cells being nerfed into the ground. Right. That means I like that. I don't think they're necessarily like just like taking it from like 100 to like zero. Right. Um, but I it's not going to be they, like... They, they're going to want you to go chase whatever this new thing is, right? Like, that's, right. that's I mean... Which is good. I hope it's a little bit easier to understand than Warmind Cells were, frankly. Yeah. Um, you had to use special types of weapons, and I just, ugh, I... It was exhausting. I would spawn them unintentionally sometimes. Um, I like using the Ikelos weapons a lot. Still do yeah. Ikelos SMG, still, I, since I got my god roll I last love summer. the Ikelos shotgun, and I still, I still want to run Prophecy yeah. to get the new one, because I still haven't gotten it, so... Yeah, it, it took me several runs to finally get it to drop for me, and thank God I got a god roll on it. Yeah. Um, so let, let's get into let's get into some of these changes. Let's do Base war mine cells reduced radius of the explosion effect range ten meters down to six meters. That's pretty significant. That's that's a forty percent damage reduction, mm-hmm. um, or range, which okay. Um, I feel in seasonal activities and raids is probably when you're going to feel that the most. Yeah. Reduced damage of the... Ex- this is the big one for me. This this is where I really think that they're just like... This and Wrath of Wrath of Rasputin is where it's going in. Reduced damage of the explosion of Warmind Cells from 200 to 400 to 50 to 250. That is... That is rough. The yeah. max you can get Oof. now is roughly... Uh, what the damage was before, the minimum damage was before. That's rough. I don't think that this means that they're no longer viable, but I think that this opens the door for you to, obviously, like you said, chase the new thing, use different seasonal mods. We don't have to rely on Warmind cells anymore for yeah. higher-end content. And to be fair, I don't know how many of us were really using them anymore. Mm-hmm. I think they were still being used in raids and Grandmasters, but... Um, I don't personally remember the last time I was running an activity with a friend and they were using them. And like I said, I'm good friends with three people who were very deep into that, had builds entirely built around Warmind cells. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and now they're just like, there, there's too many other, there's too many other options now. And I think that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah. But it, for ad control, there was nothing better than these, um, they're basically little bombs, essentially. Yeah. Uh, the global reach mod increased the mod cost of global reach to three. 
um, reduced the amount of radius increase from 20 down to 10. So they literally cut that in half and made it more expensive to use. Uh, global reach is one of those. It was supposed to amplify the power. Um, cellular suppression reduced the duration of the suppressing effect when using from three seconds to two seconds. And then Wrath of Respute, and this is the big one, reduced bonus solar damage previously, 100 to 200 damage, and now down to 25 to 100. So, obviously, they took an axe to base war mines and to Wrath of and I think those are the two ones. Uh, Global Reach got hit pretty good as well. But there are still a ton of war mine cell mods they did not touch. Maybe it's all about just building a different build now, right? Or there's nothing that says that they can't introduce a seasonal mod that will make them do the old damage again. Right. There's nothing that says they won't do that. We've seen them uh, have a willingness to go back. And I mean, look, every time Oppressive Darkness comes in, we all rejoice because that means Nova Bombs and Tethers are back on the menu for mm. days. I love a good Nova Bomb. I, I love a good Nova Bomb when I've already thrown my Tether or my uh, <laughs> Void Grenades onto something. Yeah. It's beautiful. Mm. Well, you love to see it. Mm. Especially like on like a maybe like a raid boss or something. Oh. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. You get a good Tether. You get two warlocks running Nova bombs. Hmm. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. A press of darkness is part of how we got through the uh, the first ever Master Nightfall. Yeah. Uh, that Johnny and uh, our friend uh, Sam Logo did together, and that was God. That was the season that Shadow Keep came out. So we didn't have any of these fancy toys yet, and <laughs> we were doing a Master Nightfall. It was terrible. Well, it was that, absolutely terrible because we ended up doing it on. Uh, that, that just seems like a terrible idea. That's we good. did it on the Hashladoon strike, too. Oh. Mm. Because it was the last possible day we could get it done to get the title, and we did it. That's that's brave. Uh, it was terrible. We were having problems on all of them, but just finally had to sit there and try for a few hours. Um, we also have um, elemental well changes. There are... Um, Two mods getting improvements in order to make them more competitive choice when compared to other combat style mods. Elemental Armaments has an increased chance to spawn an Elemental Well based on the tier of the enemy defeated. And Font of Might's base duration has been increased to 10 seconds and increased the damage bonus provided from 10 to 25%. I don't know anybody who uses Elemental Wells. I think, we, I think Nerd and I tried it a few times and it just didn't go well. Mm -hmm. There were, again, there were better choices. There, there were Warmind Cells. There were... Um, Oh, God, Charge with Light. Charge with Light. Thank God they have not taken an axe to Charge with Light yet. I have a feeling that that's coming with Witch Queen, though. Yeah, that seems like something that's going to be... That feels like the next one. I think that it got a bit of a reprieve for now because it's... <sighs> they updated some of the mods recently. Like, I think last... Not last season, but I think it was during Hunt... You all right there, Josh? Something happening? <laughs> Josh, looks sorry, there's stuff going on in the back. Um, I don't, I don't remember what I was saying. Uh, uh anyways, I got, uh, I got yeah, distracted Char by the noise. Probably getting an axe taken to it. Um, in um. Uh, Witch the Queen. Witch Queen, because then it, it'll have been two years of that without it being touched for the most part. We, we had a few things that have been touched. They definitely reduced the potency of a few things, but then you got things like you stack um, you stack Charge with Light with Lucent Blade and things like that, and it's just it's still an absolute monster. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, that's a system that I feel like, unless you're doing high-end content, you probably don't understand. Yeah. Um, but even I've gotten to the point where I don't feel like Charge with Light is essential anymore, and I think that's with some of these right let them run rampant for a while but then make it to where like reduce them just a little bit to where they're not the only option and like a lot of things are kind of equal again and you have this new thing that comes in new thing for you to come in and master i think elemental wells were supposed to do that and they catch on yeah. so uh and that's that is it for all the ability changes like that's that's the big chunk of uh the twab this week we do have a few updates for iron banner for next season though yes uh, two brand new weapons, the Peacebound Sidearm and the Forge's Pledge Pulse Rifle. I think that the design of these is awesome. Yeah. I Dude, really, I love, really dig it. I love that rifle. 
I love it. Yeah, that that pulse is definitely something I'm going to chase. I'm not a huge fan of Time War Inspire, which is the one we got in Chosen. Yeah. Uh, not a huge fan of it. I think it fires just a little too slow for me. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people seem to use it, but... Oh, a lot I, of people love it. I agree with you. I think it's too, too slow. I, if uh, I wanted something like that, I would, fi- I would use a scout rifle, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Or I'd run, like, Shadow Price or something like that. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think this is cool. The idea of us continually putting in, you know, two, three new weapons to earn in, in uh, Iron Banner every season. I think especially in a season that's coming up. We just got four weapons this season. We got two last season. We got two, I believe, with um, Season of the Hunt as well. And now we're going to have two more. The loot has been entirely refreshed for Iron Banner, um, which is good, especially into as long of a season as we're about to. Mm-hmm. I think that's important to let people be able to chase them. And, you know, if you have them on like a one-year timer of, okay, we did them and now we're going to kind of retire them. I think that makes a vendor refresh for Iron Banner a absolute priority, which we know that they've said it is. I think that makes it essential that, especially if things aren't going to be sunset, you should be able to buy with your tokens rolls of specific weapons from Saladin once you've unlocked said weapon. Yeah. Or like have a legacy section like, oh, this season we're going to we're going to have him sell these four weapons that are older again. Like we're, we're going to let you buy the, uh, the Fool's Remedy, for example. That uh, was the sidearm from Arrivals. Mm-hmm. I know that one doesn't really drop as much anymore. We're going to let you buy that or we're going to let you buy Forward Path. I use Forward Path all the time as a primary auto. I have no reason not to use that gun. It's that it's that good as a primary auto rifle to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I use that and um, shit. I've taken that into day one. I have two day one raids now, uh, a day one dungeon, and an awful lot of crucible and uh, raids and grandmasters since. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think this is cool. Like if the if this pulse fires a little bit faster, I think it's going to be really good. Like I, it's weird. I hope that it fires similar to blast furnace, which I. I, I say that ironically because blast furnace fires very similar to time war inspire i think they may actually even be the same rpm but it hit differently for some reason i think it's because of the actual like model of the gun um you know we talk about different frames and i think that they have a different frame even if they fire roughly the same speed right uh, i'd like to see something like that um and, you know that's, that's and that's one of the things i'm going to talk about next week you know we talk about things that we hope to see you know, going forward, and for me, it's it's bringing back a lot of the Forge weapons. That's one of the things I want to see. Yeah, uh, and the remaining Prime weapons. I think that those are two Prime opportunities. Those are very good guns that were taken out of the game. If you're not going to sunset things, basically, I I think they're going to eventually bring back everything that w- and update them. You know, sunset them and then bring them back with new perk pools. I'm okay with that. Um, but eventually bring back everything except for those four very problematic guns, which is the whole reason sunsetting was introduced, right? Right. Um, and the, but that's not all. Iron Forerunner armor. I want. Let's talk about this for a second. This this reminds me of the Japanese set that we got several, ago, maybe even a couple of years ago at this point. Yeah, it's very reminiscent, at least in terms of the chest plates. The chest plates and the legs, I think, are very similar to that. Yeah. I so I like. I want to go, I want to go through these. I like the titan helmet i'm actually a pretty big fan of it the horns i don't i see like the titan helmet's like the only part of the set i don't like I, that's funny because like i think they almost look, look like squid tentacles in a way like this is very clearly supposed to be like an under the sea set yeah and it's, it's funny because the description literally says pulled from the depths of forgotten seas yeah um the hunter helmet is just god off yeah what's Holy happening shit. there what's Holy happening shit, there? that's terrible the cloak, I think, is kind of cool if it's not, like, one of those that, like, isn't actually a cloak. Yeah. Um, I think the whole, like, having the crown, it almost looks the crown, it almost looks like Crown of Tempest mm-hmm. from the, the Warlock. So I yeah. really like that. Uh, what is going on with that Warlock chest piece? The, like, firecrackers? Are those party favors? They look like, they like empty the, rolls of toilet paper. Is are those, like, like, yeah, are they, to- are they toilet paper wrappers? Are they going to play telephone with their with their guardian but friends? To be fair, the Titan Mark has those, too, and it's like, ugh, what's happening? The Titan Mark has them. I don't see them anywhere on the Hunter. I, I do. Just think, like, right our, there on the shoulder. Oh, god damn it, I see it. Oh, my god, my cloak is going to be made of it. Oh, no. <laughs> TP cloaks for hunters, the guys. I hope bond is those two little horns. I hope that's what that is. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, like, outside of, like, the foofiness, I don't know. I, A1 Johnny texted me about this today, and he's like, dude, new Iron Banner set. He's like, this is ugly as hell. And I, I was like, I haven't seen it yet. Like, I'm sure it's not. I defend the Iron Banner sets a lot more than I should because the Hunters usually look pretty decent. Holy hell, this armor looks terrible. I don't, <laughs> like, I don't defend this the Titan awful. armor. I don't defend the Titan armor at all because it always looks ugly. It I like the tight ugly. chest piece, though. I will say that. You said it before we got rolling. It finally looks like you're not wearing rain gutters. Yeah. It looks like a, you're, you were invited to, like, a normal... But, like, what is that, like, a fucking, like, crab claw coming yeah, out of your arm? it is. It is. I don't want to talk about it. It is. I, I kind of like it. It's... <laughs> I, I'm zooming in to take a look at this. Like, I don't think that that's terrible. It's ugly. Why are there so many buckles? There's seat belts on all this somebody, armor. Somebody played some Kingdom Hearts before they designed this armor, and you know they're like, you know what? You know what Destiny Dude, doesn't have enough of? There are so many. Belt there are buckles. so many fucking like Velcro like and buckle things on this. Like, did we step into like Payless or something? Like, holy I mean, look hell! At, look at the hunt or look at the warlock though. It's it's covered in rope. It's got it's, yeah, it's it covered a, in rope, dude. I want you to. And look at the tight, like the Titans, like waistline. It's yeah, so I know. bad, dude. There's there's six buckles. There's one for there's one for like okay, the utility I'm, belt. I'm counting on the hunter. We have six on the chest piece alone. We have three on each arm. We have four more on the chest piece as you go down, and two across the groin. Mm. Oh my god, dude! His sh I swear to God, their shoes are just gonna be like big ass buckles. Mm. Just lean into it, guys. Lean into it at this point. Mm. This I looks terrible. I can't wait to never use this, but I do like the perks that they're providing with it. Like what? Are, what are the what are the belt buckles even doing on the, ch the hunter chest piece? They're not servicing anything. They're just there. Uh, dude, I don't know. It's like they took a command <laughs> strips and put them on. It's so bad. <laughs> Give us some rope or like some wire or something like tie it back behind us i don't know what to do like dude i don't <laughs> what are these buckles? i don't want to talk about it i'm mad uh, this helmet is so bad it looks like they broke into someone's car and all they stole were the seat belts <laughs> dude i'm sick <laughs> like it's not even, it's like they're like they're fanny pack belts that's what they are yeah they found all the fanny packs. They went to the ruins of Universal Studios Orlando, pulled <laughs> all the fanny packs out of uh, the collapse, and then made armor with them. Oh my gosh. What are like, they doing? The Warlock chest piece looks like Christmas crackers. Have you ever had those? Christmas crackers? Yeah, they're like Wait. little like little party favor things that you pull open that look exactly like that. You got like a little toy or a little hat in them or something. Hmm. It's, it's a European thing. It's okay. Well... Mm, if you, if you have ever had Christmas crackers, I want you to let us know. Yes, please let me know what a Christmas cracker is. Let us let Corey know what a Christmas cracker is. So and don't send me a picture self. of White Santa, please. Jesus Christ! Oh, <laughs> uh, I do like I do like this though. Um, the Iron Lord's Pride intrinsic parts. This is going to be built into the armor sets. I think this is a signal of things to come with new armor sets, right? Um, wearing a piece of this armor grants a small chance of an enhancement prism dropping at the end of an Iron Banner match. Each additional piece worn increases the chance, capping out at four pieces total. I think that's really cool. It's a way to earn, you know, more prisms, ultimately more golf balls. I think that's cool. I'd like to see a perk like that introduced in, like, each mode going forward, maybe. And I think this is kind of testing the grounds for, uh, the Witch Queen, Mm -hmm. For like, oh, well, when we do the Gambit, Crucible, and uh, Vanguard sets, maybe we'll do that. Like, this is a, this is a perk we already see in Ghosts. Mm -hmm. So, I think this is really cool. Um, it It's mainly there to help those who are grinding out activities. But you do the, you wear this set as ugly as it looks. <laughs> Slap some universal mods on it or something, boys yes, and girls. Please. Um, you do that, just become I wish, giant. I wish... I... I wish they. We talked about this already last. Maybe it was like a couple weeks ago. I just want like the universal ornaments of the sets of armor. Like, I don't know. Just keep going. I'm already upset. I'm already upset I, that I'm going to be some weird looking fish person. Like, I, I like think Guillermo del Toro is going to make a love story out of me or something. Dude, I'm saying I I like how this <laughs> looks. I'm a big plan. I'm a big plan, big fan of this. Um, I think this is really cool. 
I want to see more of this uh, in other activities. And this definitely is, we talk about, you know, playing around with things and that's six months to gather the data and decide if you want to apply that as a perk to something else. Um, but change it up, you know, give me, give me a chance at, uh, at cores, maybe give me a slim chance at a golf ball. Um, I don't know, like, uh, planetary materials, you know, planetary materials, glimmer. Like, I think there's a lot of things you can do here, right? Like that we already have, hell, give me a set that gives me like, uh, extra XP, like 5% extra XP. I don't know. Like there, there's plenty of things you can do here. And I really like that. Um, kind of closing out the Schwab though, uh, new, new prime gaming bundle up. Fireworks emote is part of it. If you've never gotten the fireworks emote, go get it. I like it a lot. Um, and there is uh, an exotic sparrow in it. Yeah. So a little interested about that. It looks terrible, but I'm curious to see what it does. Uh, Vanishing point exotic sparrow. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, there is not a lot left in here. Just we are we're getting very close to the end uh, of the season. It's happening. I would I I would again <clears throat> suggest that uh, you use all of your Vanguard tokens because they are about to go away. Um, you have ten days, ten eleven days left from the time of us saying this. Ten days, ten days because um, servers are going to go down. Obviously, the morning of the twenty fourth if they don't go down Sunday night. Right. Um, so get those tokens turned in. Uh, scrap everything you get because you're probably not going to get a good roll on anything, and get a lot of those cores maybe have a chance at some prisms. Um, but yeah. Corey. Yes. Before we go into the world. Yes. We have a topic that was specifically asked by one of our listeners to bring up. Let's do it. I like listener questions. I like listener questions too. Stonky two wrote in. Yeah. Says, he goes, th thank you for your question, by the way, Stonk. I appreciate it. He goes, um, I want to hear you guys' thoughts on the epilogue and on the rumors of a certain nerd from IO trying to contact us. Let's let's start there. We we actually went through the entire TWAB and we have not talked about the epilogue yet. We normally yeah. do story content at the top. But I kind of wanted to hold it for the end because we're we're gonna bookend it. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the epilogue. We're gonna talk about this this rumor and this crazy chase and rabbit hole that raid secrets went down. Yeah. And then we're gonna end it with the final piece of Beyond the Endless Night or Beneath the Endless Night. The epilogue, like as a whole, um, I think I was a little bit disappointed that it was just a no another override. But I think we all knew from the second that we were dropped into the. Um, scourge of the past of Boss Arena that something was going to happen. Yeah. Um, it was just a little bit too convenient that we're there in the middle of a boss arena and that's where they chose to let the uh, Lixney live. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think, you know, the dialogue you get when you go to the helm is really cool. Like, you just, you get a summons to go to the helm immediately and, like, the servitor is freaking out and you listen to the message from Lakshmi and what she's saying. And it's, I mean, it's dark. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. It's it's dark it's dark shit. Um, there is just simply no way around it. Uh, while we're talking, I'm going to see if I can uh, possibly find uh, what she says. But Corey, what you what do you think of us going back to the Elixir quarter? And this is how we're having to do it. Um, did 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 you like that? Do you think it could have been done a little bit better? Uh, what you think? I mean, it could have been done a little bit better, I think. But I mean. Overall, I kind of realized that this is, like, if this was, like, a big expansion story, like, huge story moment or huge, like, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I feel like this main campaigns of the major expansions have more production behind them than the seasonal stuff. I'm actually surprised we actually just got a cutscene in general because mm -hmm. it's been it's been like those those. Uh, you know, animated art slides, right? Like, don't get me right. wrong, those are cool, right? Like, the the Saint-14 one was cool. The, you know, the Zavala one was, like, a, a lot of the ones that we've seen during the course of this expansion have been cool. Uh, but we don't usually get an, a full cutscene, right? And right. I... Dude, that cutscene was really cool, by the way. Uh, revealed a yeah, lot let's, of... Let's go, let's go there next. Okay. You know, the cutscene... I'm not able to find Lakshmi's dialogue. Um, but she basically says something to the degree 
know, uh, you kind of get the impression by the end she's talking to Osiris. Mm -hmm. And she's been taught how to open uh, open a portal. And there's two different versions of this mission. There's one where you get the Vex in the city. And there's one where the Taken show up. Mm -hmm. uh, the ending is still the same no matter what. It's still, it's still killing the Vex. Mm -hmm. um, and this cutscene, though, when, when we're looking at this cutscene, I think it's very cool for what it symbolizes um you know you see you see some drags and some vandals running and they're backed into a corner and you see you know mithrax is, and if you're listening to the dialogue during the mission mithrax and saint are talking you know they're 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 getting overwhelmed uh -huh. we find we see at the end they're in the elixir quarter defending them um you can't actually see them during the mission but they are in the cutscene they're defending in the elixir quarter um and Mithrax basically is like, you know, um, we're, you know, go, you, you know, you have to protect your people. And it's so, I think it's so powerful what Saint says. Saint Bella was like, he yells it back at him. Mm -hmm. I am defending my people. You are my people. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy who at the beginning of the season still hated the fallen. And it wasn't until Mithrax shared the legend of Saint with them that he really changed. And Mithrax tells him, if we fall today, the new legend will be how the saint stood with us until the very end. And then out of nowhere, uh, a Nova bomb, you know, saint, saint can't reload. He starts punching the Vex like he always does. <laughs> and then a Nova bomb comes down out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. it's like Cora floating down. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, Amanda Holiday shooting with the chaperone. From mm -hmm. behind them, get, we can talk about how badass Amanda is for a second. Yeah, dude, she just walks up. She just like she's runs into the arena, and she she comes in with a sniper. She's no scoping a man. It's great. That's that's a joke in case you didn't get it. Yeah. Chaperone shoots from so far away that it might as well be a sniper. Yeah. Um, I think that was really cool. And then of course you know you have Zavala show up, and them with defending. his uh, D one Vanguard <laughs> auto rifle. <laughs> Dude, it's so bad. Like, can we get my can we get my man a gnawing hunger at least? Like, come on, dude. I've got like fifteen chroma dude, rushes in my vault. All you these, can have one. All, Help yourself. All of the character all of the characters have like their like specific weapon. Even Amanda has the chaperone, right? Like Well, I mean, so that that's that at least makes sense. That's the fam that's her family's weapon. I know, but that's what I'm saying. Everybody has a Did weapon. She jacked that out of my vault? I wanna know. <laughs> I mean, like Cade has ace of spades, right? Uh, right. Uh, you know, even S Saladin has his own weapons. Why was Zavala sleeping in like the the armory or whatever? Because like what that gun reminded me of was that very first mission, the homecoming mission of the Red War, where <laughs> yeah, Shaq yeah. Shaq like Shaq steals my raise lighter. Yeah, Shaq like opens the door and he's like, and Shaq's, it says, Shaq's pick up a my weapon. Sword, and we have all these generic ass weapons in yeah. there. Yeah. They're just God. basic blue and orange Vanguard weapons, and Zavala runs in with one of those. I'm like, oh my gosh, come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Um, and meanwhile, while all this is going on, Osiris is standing on a building just watching it, and mm -hmm. once they defeat the Vex, the portal is closed, Osiris turns and walks away. And Ikora notes afterwards that Osiris has... He's missing. Yeah, she's like, Stay I haven't been... What did she say? She's like, I haven't been able to locate Osiris. Uh, yeah, she hasn't been able to locate Osiris. Um, I have I've referenced a few times this season that um, I got spoiled on something major the very first day of the season. What I got spoiled on was that Osiris goes missing at the end, mm -hmm. um, and so that like and we've joked about faux Osiris, but I mean if you if you read the lore, like quite literally, it's pretty much explicitly told to us like Osiris is not Osiris. Yeah. Um, and if it actually is him, that's terrifying because he's doing this without. Them. Yeah. Um. I think. So I think I think the cutscene is really cool. Again, like I really wish we had a theater mode because I'd like to go back and rewatch this. Uh, having to go to YouTube. Um. There is. There's just so. There's so much here. Um. That is just really, really, really good. Uh, I'm trying to find Saints talk that he gives you at the end. Saint and Ikora both have really good dialogue um, at the end of all of this. And I'd like to find where it is. If it's, uh, of course, it's not on Ishtar Collective yet. It's not on Ishtar Collective. Um, which is entirely possible. I don't know. Um, 
you do no, that's definitely not it. I, I I'm I'm looking. I realize like this is really bad, and I probably should have had this pulled up ahead of time. Uh, it's it's not on here yet. I'm sure in the coming weeks it will be. Um, but yeah, you know, Saint Saint is troubled. Saint and Ikora are both troubled that Osiris is missing. And if you go to the tower, Osiris's character model is actually missing from the tower. It's not there. Yeah, it like is down actually by, down in like the bazaar by where New Mar mm -hmm. Monarchy used to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely not there. Um, that is uh, probably the latest confirmation that we have. But uh, you know, it is what it is. At the end of the day, um, that to me sets up what we're going to do this next season. I think it's going to really be the hunt for Osiris, and I think at the end of the season is when we're going to, or even at the beginning, is when we get it confirmed that that is not Osiris. That the real Osiris is either dead or is like locked in a Mad Eye Moody esque trunk. I still think that's where we're going. He's going to be in a. He's gonna be in a I, I think that's where. We're going. I think them killing off Osiris, like, and then just being like, "Oh, by the way, we did this," would just be like, so underwhelming. Yeah. Um, and you might like actually have a mutiny on your hands. Yeah. It might not be the smartest thing to do at this point. It, it would not be a smart thing. I think that you would absolutely have people screaming over it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I thought this was really cool, but this other thing that we have going on and this, this is, let me, let me get this actual, let me get this article actually pulled up for a second. So in First off, you can find Lakshmi's body, which I was really enjoying seeing all the videos of people shooting and teabagging her body. <laughs> um, that That is my major complaint, is that I think it would have been cool if there was like a chase through the city streets where we were literally running her down on a sparrow or something. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's another one of those moments where like... And then we had to do like a boss fight against her. Yeah. I think that could have been really cool. Like she's summoning legions of Vex and then like as she dies is like... Well, you know, they're already in the Elixney Quarter and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like as she's dying, she's telling us that she's basically condemning the fallen to death. I that would have been really cool. Um, but here, here's the crazy conspiracy theory that we have going on right now. Asher Mir, our old crazy, uh, I don't want, Doc Brown doppelganger, is Guardian. <laughs> seemingly back from the dead. What? Alert, radio Larian light. There's no hole in the ground. There's no pit in the pyramidium. That this guy is somehow back from the dead. Oh, God. And so I'm, I'm going to break this down. Uh, via Paul Tassi, I'm going to break this down because I don't really know a better way to summarize this than what him and Kotaku have both written. There is a friendly harpy in the epilogue mission across from where you spawn, and it has a blue eye instead of a red eye. You cannot shoot it. So the question is, well, how do you think that's Asher? The harpy is beeping, and of course, leave it to the guys from the guys from Raid Secrets over on Reddit. Well, of course, if you translate the beeps as Morse code, oh, you get geez. the word "assistant," which is what Asher Mir always called you whenever you interacted with him on IO. Right. Even all the way to the end in the lore book, before he descends into the Pyramidian, as he sees you fly off, he thinks about the assistant is specifically the wording that is used the harpy is standing in front of what is essentially an exact replica of the equipment asher Mir used to use on io and we have screen caps to confirm this as well asher Mir is part of the Scho scholastic variable lore uh which uh we are at, we're gonna read tonight that's that's the other piece that we're gonna do tonight um when Lakshmi was predicting what would happen in the Batsa district, there are two different passages in it that say Asher speaks. Uh, and in fact, we're we're actually I'm going to cut over to that real quickly right now. Uh, let me give me a second to pull this up. I wasn't prepared yet, but scholastic variable. We're we're going to read this one out real quickly because I think it's important to deviate into this for just a moment. Deviating. Deviating. Uh, it was not where I thought it was. This, there we go. Just uh, are you are you there? Are you? 
I, I, I'm there. Go ahead. Go ahead and do your thought, though, Corey. Oh, I was just gonna ramble about like how I just think the storytelling and the like some of the secret stuff in in this last couple seasons has been top tier. I read a I read an article. I forget. I, it might have been Paul Tassi. I don't remember who it was, but mm-hmm. it was a uh, Destiny's storytelling has become its strong suit, and it was just like it's a really really good article. Um, you know? I think that may have been from. Uh, might have been Game Informer, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it was Liana. She uh, she writes a lot of that stuff. Um, she, well, her her and Paul are killing it when they talk about this game. Yeah, um, it's funny because whenever I see her write something, it's usually like right after we talk about it in Tower Casuals, and I'm like, oh, like I feel like that we were we, we talked about this. We're ahead of the curve for once. Um, but in the, this lore, and it's written out very weird, very weirdly, um, stochastic variable. However certain we are of simulations, they always contain an element of unpredictability. Lakshmi 2. And the way this is... I'm going to read this out. There, There's seven bullet points here. Lakshmi 2. Faction head. Exo. Politician. 1. The Elixni Quarter. Screaming. A crackling portal. Treachery. Fallen attack. We're overrun. Where are the Guardians? 2. The Last City. Tower in Ruins. Fallen scavengers sift the rubble. 3. The Last City. Radioactive dust. Dark grows in the dark dark growths in the ruins. Where is the traveler? Mutated ghosts. I want to come back to that mutated ghosts in a future episode. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that gives us an indication of where we be, where we may be going with uh, the witch queen and why some of those theories and uh, those leaks may not be too far fetched. Uh, but I want I want a time to develop my thesis there. Four. Here's the first evidence of Asher, the Elixni Quarter, crackling portal. Asher speaks. Fallen being attacked. Dead orbit overhead. Saint-14 besieged. Future war cult surrenders. Now, that exact scenario right there is what happens in this event. The Elixni Quarter is overrun. There is a portal that opens. If that... If that... Uh, what you call it? If that Harpy is actually Asher, he speaks. The Fallen attacked dead orbit we know leaves the city in the aftermath of all of this saint 14 is besieged and the war cult surrenders which they do five the elixir quarter the endless night a crackling portal mithrax firing wildly the cult flees ikora triumphant also happens here's the second one the elixir quarter crackling portal snipers fire down blood runs in the gutter an ether tank explodes the Endless Night. Asher speaks. Those future war cult traitors. Seven. The Batsa District. Crackling Portal. Fallen Fleet. Future war cult banners. Zavala is gone. Mithrax on trial. Lakshmi 2 looks over the crowd. Lakshmi 2. Head of State. Exo. Prophet. Savior. We know that numbers four and five came true. Right. Um, number one also did. So one, four, and five came true. To an extent, number six did as well, because we know an ether tank exploded earlier in the lore, not necessarily during this event, but I'm sure right. one did during this event. Right. Um, and that the future war cult are in fact traitors. Yeah. So to circle back around to Paul Tassi's articles, it's Asher Mir, but how and why? The running theory is that either Asher Mir is not dead and communicating to us from the shrouded darkness zone via the Harpy, or he is dead and has become part of the Vex network, something he is well-versed in before all this given the integration of his arm and by proxy brain, which gave him insight. This is the third time we've seen a blue-eyed Vex Harpy, once in Beyond Light, once back in Vanilla, but they was channeling a member of Failsafe's old crew, and perhaps beyond, but blah, 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 perhaps both the Beyond Light Harpy and this current Harpy were both Asher Mir, or at least his conduit. Is this more than an Easter egg? I don't know. It seems unlikely after this season that season 15 will deal with the Vex, given we just had a very Vexy season. We also have no idea if a place like Io will ever return, which would open the door to see Asher Mir in the flesh again if he isn't dead. He might just be our envoy in the Vex network going forward. But if he would actually learn to talk instead of using Morse code, that would be immensely Go see Asher yourself in the override mission on top of a building by equipment across from where you spawn in. This this is now the most interesting lore conspiracy theory, I think, in the game. 
Yeah, that's... Mm. This is a bungee-ass thing to do. Of course it is. Okay, to put more... This is not the first time... They, they had us doing binary for the original uh, uh, Outbreak. For yeah. the original Outbreak Prime, they had us doing this. And, I mean, like, think about the puzzles they had us go through for Sleeper Stimulant. You know, that they've had us do for, you know, Bastion for corridors of time. Like, this is far from the first time Bungie has put something in like this because they know somebody's going to find it. Reddit or Twitter is going to solve it within the day and we're all going to freak out over it. That's why Niobe Labs was such a big deal when nobody could solve it and they had to just unlock the forge for us. Right. This is cool. I think right now. As it stands, this is a glorified Easter egg until Bungie acts on it. I do agree that I think we will not have anything with the Vex probably until the Witch Queen now. I highly doubt next season is dealing with the Vex. Yeah, I don't think so either. The Vex to me are one of the end game races um, of all this. I've always said, you know, I've said, I think the Hive and the Taken are ultimately the end, but the Vex very clearly are intertwined with the darkness of. Judging by Destiny 1 content, judging by Destiny 2 content, they're very closely tied with the Black Garden. I mean, the Black Garden is the birthplace of the Vex, essentially. Right. Yeah. Well, not really the birthplace. It's like a holy place for the Vex, almost. Yeah. I still think we're seeing the actual forge that they're from eventually in a raid. Mm -hmm. But that will probably not be until Whitefall. Maybe even maybe even the expansion after. Like Maybe that's where we fight the darkness for real. Yeah. Um, this is really cool, though. I think this opens the door for NPCs to really take more of a starring role. And it's something we've wanted to see for a long time, right? NPCs fighting alongside us in these missions, programming them to, to fight with us. The level of interactivity we've gotten this season and in Season of the Chosen, I think, and even Hunt, to an extent, has been awesome. It's been awesome. This is what we've wanted for a long time. I really hope they keep going forward. And that the hollow projectors and things like that aren't just, oh, it's easier for us to do than cutscenes because we're not together right now. You know, these hand-drawn cutscenes or the, these artistically done ones aren't just because we don't have the budget or because we're not together. That makes it easier to tell stories through than animating a full-on cutscene like this. Mm -hmm. it's a, lot of the, a lot of budget went into making this, clearly. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy this cutscene didn't leak ahead of time, even though... The plot point did. Yeah, I think this is really cool. It didn't get data mined and posted all over the internet or something. Um, the only thing that you posed to me earlier, what Tuesday I think, when we both got to see it, was where's Crow? That and I think that is the biggest question here is where where is the Crow? And my personal theory is that because Zavala said he was sending him off to scout things. Mm -hmm last season and crow very clearly has not been off scouting he's been watching over the elixir um i think it would have been cool to have him piping in and being like you, you know instead of us going into the network to fight a vex like the vex actually shows up there um in the city and we have to fight it and like you see sniper shots coming down from above and it's crow mm -hmm. um or he shoots a uh he shoots a sniper bullet it does make sense on the other hand though he is not masked only Zaval and Ikora know who he is. Right. And I do think that that is going to be one of the main plot points of season 15. There is already clearly dissension in the tower. This could quite possibly break the city between the factions are gone. They literally wrote the factions out of the game. Dead Orbit has taken the future war cult and the new monarchy and has left the city. Mm -hmm. Factions are gone. Faction rallies are never coming back. Please, Thanks, please, God. Please. No, I want I want my faction armor. I want my faction ornaments I was never able to get. I want the catalysts that we weren't able to get. I'm very upset about all this. I mean, you can bring them back. Just don't hey, just do them. Dead or, do dead them. Or don't do them the way you did them in vanilla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were bad. I just find it funny how they said that they were before forsaken like we're reworking faction rallies and they just pretended they didn't exist anymore and never brought them back it's so funny it's a little funny to me it, i mean it is funny i'm, I'm not disagreeing with you <laughs> uh, rip I, faction think, I think this is great I, I think this is great this is absolutely a favorite conspiracy theory right now uh when bungie puts something like this into the game it's never just a wink and a nod no. It will eventually come around, whether it's now or it's two years from now. Like They'll do something with this eventually. Right. I think sooner is better with this, though, because 
you're going to lose access to this once Witch Queen comes out. Yeah. So I, I think sooner is better. Um, I think this. I, I think whatever this is will be resolved some at some point in the next season. Uh, because like, w- uh, did they say? Are they? Are they unvaulting any of the old locations for Witch Queen? Did they say anything about that yet? We have no idea yet. At Luke's, Luke Smith's last stance was, and this was back in January, February, he said they were not unvaulting anything for Witch Queen. And a lot of us were trying to figure out, well, does he mean like unvaulting Destiny 2 content? Or is he saying no Destiny 1 uh, locations are coming back? And mm-hmm. I mean, I we've, we've said it so many times on this show, it's almost nauseating at this point, that we really 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 want to see the dreadnought come back yeah you know, we, we addressed it earlier on this on this episode even um and that, that's gonna be a big part of my predictions next week is that i think i do think it's coming back i think there's story reasons for it to come back yeah um it would make sense that's where savathun and zivu wrath have kind of been chilling this whole time mm-hmm. um i don't know what else you do at that point i think that if you do do that like Similar to how Toland is our guide usually in the Ascendant Plane, mm-hmm. I like the theory that Asher is that for the Vex Network. So there's no way we never go back into the Vex Network. There's mm-hmm. just no way. Yeah. We're going back in at some point. There are obviously aspects of the Taken being in there because of Quaria. Um, I yeah. mean, hell, maybe he even shows up in the Witch Queen raid. Like, I don't think Quaria is truly dead. I've expressed that. Like, yeah, maybe I don't he think so either. In the Witch Queen raid to help us defeat her for once and for all. Yeah, I, I mean, she. The, it's going to be like a what, like a first or second encounter. I feel like. I don't know if I like the idea of him being a harpy or him talking through the harpy better. I think both are completely plausible, knowing what we know about what Asher goes to do. In the Pyramidian, mm-hmm. uh, with the with the pyramids there, I'm leaning more towards he's actually in a harpy. Mm. But and I mean, uh, John John had this prediction: what if they unvault Io and we do the Pyramidian strike and instead of us fighting a uh, good old uh, Brotheon or whatever his name is? <laughs> I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's the name of the giant Vex you fight. <laughs> I, we we fight fucking <laughs> uh, we fight Asher in a giant Minotaur instead. Do what if he's just like this big ass harpy that you have to fight? What if it's just like how just... terrifying would that be if it was a harpy the size of like Atheon? I mean, that's that's a pretty big harpy. It's terrifying. It... Imagine that shooting at you. What if it's just Asher? What if it's just him? <laughs> you fight. You just fight him. <laughs> I mean, I've said for a while that I think we need to be fighting uh, Guardians. Yeah, but, but he's like big. Like he's just <laughs> huge. Do we have any fi- do you have any final thoughts on the Asher Mirror conspiracy theory? Uh, no. I feel like I'm kind of starting to talk in circles. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's cool. I don't really have anything else to say about it. Uh I just I w- I think there would be more to talk about if we knew what was happening already after the 24th, but Yeah, we, we, we may it. we may have to circle back to this conspiracy theory on the 24th. John and I may be frantically googling to bring this back up. Um, or yeah, once, once the season comes out, like Corey and I may have to talk about it on the 26th, but, uh, I want to read the final piece of beneath the endless night. Uh, it's going to be our lore corner for tonight. And it's going to be, we're, we're going to, we're going to close out with this. Um, it's one of the more somber pieces of lore this season, I think in a season that's had a lot of like really, really heavy lore survivors epitaph is especially one that's really stuck with me. Um, faux Cyrus, uh, telling Saladin. You know, not to go talk to Zavala. That you know, the the people don't trust Saladin anymore, which is almost a bold faced lie, certainly. Yeah. Um. You know, to so descent in the tower, and it feels like a tower schism is still coming. Like they've avoided a civil war for now. Mm-hmm. Um. So let's go. Let's go ahead and read Memorial, and then we'll kind of talk about wrapping up this uh, this seasonal story arc. Ten Memorial. The air upon the wall was thin. Lakshmi was right about that. Mithrax stood in silent observation of the memorial above the main concourse. He leaned against an iron railing, watching guardians and citizens alike moving below, Elixni with them. The dreg approached the memorial and led his child to stand among the mourners. Urged forward by a gentle nudge, the child gin- gingerly placed a gilded eggshell at the memorial's base. Gold so- so- soldering sealed a myriad of fractures, making a once broken egg whole again. Mithrax's throat tightened at the sight. It was a memorial for a child. Lost. 
The walkway behind Mithrax groaned as Saint-14 cut a large silhouette against the clear sky. Shoulder to shoulder they stood, and neither spoke. They watched as Ikora and Zavala conversed with departing mourners. The dragon and his son approached, and with a bittersweet smile, Ikora made certain to introduce them to Zavala. Big, stern, stoic Zavala took to one knee and spoke to the child eye to eye. I never thought I'd see the day, Saint finally said, unable to look away. Mithrax responded not with words, but with fluttering, purr-like rumble and mirrored Saint's posture. Do you think this will hold? An alliance, fragile like glass, held in a fist, Saint asked. Only the great machine knows what will come from over the horizon. We must be content with our own limited perspectives, Mithrax said with conviction. Saint nodded. Down below, Amanda Holiday drew their attention as she knelt below the mem- before the memorial to light a candle. She stood and stepped back, lingering. Mithrax and Saint watched in silence as she rose up on her toes and began scanning through the crowd, as if she were looking for someone. She gently pushed through the throng of people and reached out to another mourner in a white cloak. Both recoiled in surprise, Amanda seemingly apologizing to the cloaked woman at some misunderstanding. They exchanged brief words, awkward laughs, sympathies. When Amanda caught sight of Sat Lord Saladin, however, she took her leave and disappeared into the crowd. Mourners parted around the Iron Lord, respectful of his space and reputation, as he laid a handful of spent shell casings at the memorial with reverence. The offering's meaning was lost on Mithrax. When Saint rose from the memorial, he turned and looked up at the pair on the overwatch, his face cast in shades of doubt, remorse, and uncertainty as he quietly departed. I do not know that one, Mithrax said with a look to Saint. He seems unhappy. Saint slowly took, shook his head. Lord Saladin, he clarified. He has lost many, lost his heart, his hope. Lost so many, he believes he stands alone, even when surrounded by others. I understand his pain. I see... Saint thinks on how Osiris would describe it. It's a cautionary tale. Mithrax heard the ache in Saint's voice. And how are you? Saint tensed at the question. The railing in his hand creaked as his grip tightened and bent the metal. I am fine, he lied. Indeed, Mithrax said with his best affection of sarcasm and then placed a hand on Saint's shoulder. It is not above a warrior's station to feel pain. Not above a warrior's station to express spirit wounds. Mithrax's grip firmed on Saint's shoulder, reassuring, stabilizing. Not above a warrior station to break. Saint nodded in half-hearted agreement. I should go, he said in a tone to Mithrax. Did quite, didn't, didn't quite understand. Thank you, Kel of Kells. You are a true friend. Go well, Saint, Mithrax said with concern. Find your lost phoenix. Um... So let's let's start with Amanda, I guess. I think that's the first thing that kind of jumps out to me here. She's looking for somebody in a cloak, and she goes towards him, somebody in a white cloak. It's pretty clear she's looking for Crow. Yeah. Um. So I think that's that's the mystery. Where's Crow? Where's Osiris? Obviously, mm-hmm. Fosiris. We're gonna call him Fosiris. That's not Osiris. Fosiris. I think that kind of sets up for Amanda and Saint to probably be the primary NPCs for next season with you. Yeah, it's there's almost no way Mithrax isn't as well. Yeah, I. uh... So why why would she be looking for Crow? Did I miss something? Did I? Did she I worked a lot. Her? She worked a lot with Crow in the season of the Chosen. They have banter back and forth. Right. Okay. Yeah. But he was always masked. Right. So. Um, and I think that 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 a whole new ripple is added to that because I mean she she's clearly still just devastated by Kate's death. Yeah. Um, she's one of the ones in the tower that it clear. I mean, it clearly weighs on Zavala, but yeah. on her, it seems to weigh more than any of the other NPCs, any of the other characters. Yeah. Um, the storytelling they're doing with Saladin though, that they did in chosen and that they did this season, even though it's quietly been off screen this season has still, I think been very powerful. He's unsure of what to think of after we negotiated a truce with Keitel. We have a ceasefire temporarily, and you know now we're welcoming the Elixni into our city. And he's watched so many of his friends die to both. You know what? How can you be friends with them? Is what he's thinking. But I think he's also learning how to show mercy for the first time and show restraint. Mm-hmm. Not something Saladin has ever really had to do. I think it's setting up for him to have a major story beat going forward. And if we talk about, you know, we talked about, are they going to write out some of these characters we've had around since the beginning? I think Saladin's a logical choice. Mm-hmm. 
Um, as much as I like Saladin, I think that opens the door for Ephrodite to come back. Yeah. Um, and I could see him, maybe not like in Witch Queen, but like in Lightfall, I could have see him having like a giant moment of self sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And uh, people go, "Oh, well, what it's about like, Iron Banner?" Like that well, moment where he realizes he's not standing alone, and he realizes that he needs to save yeah. the people that are behind him and stand with him. Right? Like I could totally see that. There's, you know, the uh, I read, I read a lot. I read some manga and I watch some anime, and I, I watch a lot of My Hero Academia. Mm-hmm. There's a character in there that I kind of want to draw a comparison to Lord Saladin and how I feel like his storyline is going. There's a character in there, uh, Kirishima, who he has a power to harden. He can harden his skin into like harder than stone. And he hits a new level in a uh, in an arc against the Yakuza where uh, he has a new form. His hero name is Red Riot and he has a form Red Riot Unbreakable. He can only hold it for 35 to 40 seconds, but for that period of time, he is literally unmovable, unbreakable. Like he is so hard that when he goes to move, he can hear his skin and his bones creaking. But his thing is he calls himself that and he says he's unbreakable because nobody behind me is going to bleed. If I can keep all their attention on me, and he does it time and time again in these, you know, we, you keep thinking he's going to die doing this. You know, he's become one of the most important supporting characters in that show and in that manga. In that way, I feel like Saladin is kind of that way, that Saladin is going to eventually get to a point where it maybe it's him and Ephrodite together, the final two Iron Lords holding the line. And, you know, basically saying, you know, in Rise of Iron, he tells us you're the first of the new. You know, and then really picked up on that plot point again and i think we're overdue to visit that but you do that maybe you combine that with an iron banner rework like Shax continues to run the iron banner in memory of his friend um i think there's a lot coming for salad in in the coming seasons and in the coming years but that it's ultimately if there's one character that's going to sacrifice himself it's going to be saladin it's going to be one of the titans it's either saladin or zavala it's one of the two I think I think Sal I think it's gonna be Saladin just because I still think Zavala is still too important right now. I, I think he's too big. I th- in turn, I think he's too big of a name. I, I think that you know, you kill off Lance Reddick, you're killing off the guy who not only acts in your game but plays it pretty regularly too. I think you're really like you're risking some stuff there. I feel. And like with Crow, like Crow's not here because I think Crow's in the Dreaming City right now. I think he's about to encounter Mara. Yeah, I think so too. I think we're gonna. Encounter I think Mara is back in this season because this is it. Like this season fifteen is that unless they magically announce, hey, we're doing a season sixteen too because six months is way too long to go without new content. Uh, which I'll both be happy and I'll be pissed about. <laughs> I don't want another season of content right now. Um, I think you you're you would be able to bring that and then like maybe have Mithrax, you know, uh maybe brokering the peace. You know, between, you know, Mara, Crow, Petra, the city, like all these factions are gonna be at each other's throat. And then I mean future Warhold is still out there. Like future Warhold, Dead Orbit, New Monarchy have all left the city. Like they are still out there. We don't know quite maybe what's gonna happen new, there. Maybe there'll be a new leader that we have to face or something, you know? I mean, it's pretty clear the Dead Orbit leader is in charge because the leader of New Monarchy, I believe, is in custody. Or he's dead, one of the two. He's either in custody or he's dead. Dead Orbit has taken the remainder of those factions that wish to leave. Um, and the rest, it's presumed to have gone into hiding. Akora makes it clear, like, not all of them were complicit in this plot. But Dead Orbit was already planning to leave. They refused to be a part of the coup. They were. They made it clear, we're leaving soon. Yeah. I, I still hold to the theory that I think Dead Orbit comes back at some point to help evacuate the city like they did during the Red War. Um, that's their whole purpose, is mm-hmm. to be able to continue Canada and Stars. I mean, maybe we don't see the factions again. Maybe we see them at the beginning of whatever the next destiny is after the end of Light and Dark. Maybe they finally have done what they what the Exodus mission set to do, and they've colonized uh, an outpost somewhere. You know, and we, we, see, go- we see the good old uh, My Chemical Romance-esque leader of Dead Orbit again. Mm. You know, I, I think there there's plenty of possibilities here. I think this opens up a lot of those. Um, I think it's important to see that you know Zavala and Ikora are mourning too. Like this is this is an Elixir memorial. This is, you know, this isn't necessarily for you know just humans. And I do think that this is something that they're going to put in the tower. I do think you're going to have a permanent addition to the tower, similar to the hole that is in the tower from the impact of the Almighty. 
Yeah. I think you're going to have something um, either where the Guardian game statue is or where the Solstice of Heroes statue normally goes. Yeah. I think there's going to be a permanent addition to the tower somewhere. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, if it's an evolving world, like, you kind of have to do that, right? Yeah, of course. So, uh, I, I like this, though. I think it's a really somber ending. Um, next week, hopefully, I'll be able to do the final piece of lore from this season for the uh, exotic ship that I thought was going live this week. But um, apparently, there may be one final mission next week. Ooh. I may be as simple as just going and interact. I, I personally think it's going to be us seeing this memorial on the tower and just going up and interacting with it for a free ship. Mm-hmm. Um, similar to how we got the the emblem for the thing that we did with the uh, almighty wreckage mm-hmm. for being part of that. Yeah. And for the live event uh, when the darkness, you know, sunset everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, were things given away during those. And they, they've, been, they've made end of season and event, events a thing. And I really like that. I hope they continue that yeah. trend. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I think the time is also, I and mean, this is kind of related to that. You know, we're out of lower corner. Kind of final thoughts on this week, I guess. Uh, when I look at something like the epilogue, I saw a lot of people saying it felt half baked, and I think it feels half baked because we are now legitimately at a point where I think the old consoles are now holding us back. I think we're at a point where Xbox One and PS4, especially the base models, are holding us all back. Um. We are approaching a time like Destiny 1 did after the Taken King where they said, okay, we have to ditch the old consoles. I think they would have to give more than a sufficient warning and hope to God that more consoles are in stock. Um, But I think we've now reached a point where the base hardware of last generation can no longer support this game. Um, It is nearly unplayable. It, It goes very slow. 60 frames is just such a game changer like you you can't you can't ignore that yeah i mean the the xbox one base version runs at sub 30 right like it's just uh, yeah, it, it's gross it's real bad yeah like if you have a one x you're probably doing okay um you can at least play but it's noticeable when i'm playing with people who are on the older consoles at this point um, I just think at some point you're going to have to leave them behind. I mean, maybe maybe this is one of the first games that uses the thing that Microsoft talked about, which is being able to play games with cloud enabled, and that's going to let them let you play older games on Xbox One. But that still doesn't solve the PS4 problem. I mean, I think um, I think I think Destiny would be the perfect thing to test it with because most of it is server yeah. side anyway, right? So right. Uh, a lot of it is, I mean, you have the locally downloaded files, but yeah, you, you still have stuff running there. And I mean, you have to have a, you have to have stable internet connection and all that, but we we're now at the point where we have to at least start having the conversation about moving on from the leg, the now legacy consoles. I think if you hadn't had COVID and you hadn't had the, obviously the impact on availability, I think Bungie would have probably already moved on this. And would have announced it for the Witch Queen. Um, I was surprised. I mean, I said it a couple times. I was very surprised they didn't know it. La- they didn't do it last year. Uh, but I don't think they wanted to pigeonhole like, oh, you have to get this new console if you want to keep playing Destiny. I think with Witch Queen being delayed to first quarter 2022, that gives you another holiday season to get through. There's already 10 million PS5s and almost 7 million Series Xs and Ss out there. I think by and not to mention cloud gaming for Xbox as well. You know, you're going to get to a point after Christmas where if they don't outright tell us in two weeks, I mean, then they very well could be like, hey, we're giving you like six, seven months warning. Try and get one of these consoles because we plan on moving. We plan on moving on. We got to we've got to leave something behind at some point. We don't want to wait until lightfall to do it. We don't want to have a whole another year and a half after this conversation of us supporting these older consoles. It's just getting harder and harder. So, well, we will definitely see what happens. Yeah, what was it? What was it for for Taken King to Rise of Iron? What did they? What was what was the time they gave us there? Like six months? Uh, three months. They told us in June, and it happened in September. So, and I think what they're doing now is obviously way more ambitious than that. Yeah, for sure. So. 
Sorry, my son is crying in the background. No, no, it's I'm all trying, good. Uh, trying let's to keep let's get on out of here, Corey. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening to Tower Casuals. Remember, you can email the show at towercasuals at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at Tower Casuals. Please give us your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts. Uh, we want them. So, Josh, where can we find you? Uh, Twitter, at Josh underscore Finn, two ends. And starting at the end of this month, I'll be back for my final run for now on Q List doing Brooklyn Nine-Nine with our friend Logan. Nice. Uh, yeah, you can find me at I am Corey in HD on Twitter. If you like Nintendo stuff, you can find me on Nintendo Power Block. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's it. I want to thank everybody for watching or listening to Tower Casuals. Remember to leave us those five stars and a nice review on iTunes if you're listening to us there. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>